All right. I believe this means we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions. Welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, uh, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, uh, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series, this horribly named podcast. And But the QA is the important part because the QA obviously stands for question and answer as we like to make this an interactive conversation. We can kind of share our thoughts and kind of look through some of the tech news stories of the last week and then also keep up with some of that uh, coverage over longer periods of time. Uh, we're not into just the headline and sharing a, a, an outrage headline on Facebook. We really want to know what's going on and, and what comes from some of these conversations. Uh, just jumping right in immediately. Uh, I, I wasn't able to do a show last week because my voice was just gone. Um, and then I still had to do a fair amount of talking over this last week, so I'm hoping my voice holds out for this podcast, too. I've got a substantial amount of water to try and drink through the course of this uh, stream, but I'm going to try and also keep this podcast to under two hours. <laughs> that never really turns out like how we think it might. But we are now officially living in the future. Uh, it seems like I haven't seen you guys since last year. Waka Waka. I absolutely hate that joke, and it's hilarious. Um, no, we are we are now in the uh, in the far off future of the year 2021. And that's one of the things that I really want to say for some of the conversation as we get to the end of the show is just what are our expectations? What is it that we want to see in consumer tech? What are some of the the trends that we would like to see continue? Um, and uh, hopefully have some of those early predictor conversations as this week we're going to be gearing up for CES and we're going to be seeing a very different kind of consumer electronics show. I'm I'm still a little bit bummed out that last year I, I needed to take a break so I didn't go to CES and now we're not going to have an in-person CES so I'm not going to get to see any of my friends this year. Um, but then from there, some of the leaks and some of the rumors that we've seen for some of, of uh, the, the the smartphones that are on our horizon, follow-ups from LG, a, a new twist on pen touch computing from Samsung, and of course, we've got some tech news that we absolutely need to, to dabble with, to play with. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing in the live chat, um, across the podcast, killed Juan's voice. Um, yeah, I was already on a trend where I probably... Uh, should have should have toned down some of my rhetoric on Sam and Matt's podcast. Um, got into some really good like you know these are cranky soapboxy kinds of topics for Juan to rant about, and I really should have backed off a little bit more because I, I did kind of tap myself out there. But again, I I, I did it again with um, uh, last week. TK and I have been trying to keep up with more regular streams, weekly content, weekly uh, podcasts, uh, just to kind of check in with, you know, a good friend and have a fun conversation. And when I start doing a lot of long form talking like that, it's, um, I gotta, I gotta plan this stuff out or space this stuff out a little bit better. Cause I'm still trying to finish up videos, you know, actual like produced videos on top of doing several hours of live streaming. So, so this, the end of the year just got a little fuzzy for me, especially for, uh, trying to join a bunch of friends, um, doing end of year shout outs. Uh, over these last two weeks, I, I joined um, Snubs, um, uh, her uh, end of the year wrap up, uh, talking about some of the, uh, the, 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 the tech trends that she was most looking forward to. I did a shout out for Salah, uh, Rolando. Um, there, there were a number of just little fun video projects to jump in and that was kind of on top of everything else too. So um, happy new year, I hope as, as we got to the end of 2020, that your New Year's celebrations were fun. I hope you got some downtime. I got a little, um, some some a, a few days to kind of unplug and just hang out with the family and uh, try and tackle some Lego projects with my daughter. And we went out on a lot of hikes and we, we tried to resurrect a micro four thirds camera so she could shoot while daddy was doing smartphone samples. Um, I, I, I hope that everyone in your circles are safe and healthy and that you got to eat some really good food. I'm breaking in a new lasagna recipe that I think is pretty monster. It's uh, 
it, it's uh, like veggies that are sauteed and then that's mixed with like a ricotta and, and a mixture of mozzarella and provolone and a ton of parmesan i think i've got i think i've got a good handle on it and a very spicy italian sausage so it, it it's um it's something that I'm 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 really feeling like just a little bit more finesse. I've got another batch of it in the freezer right now, and we're gonna try and do it later in the week. But uh, yeah, it, it was definitely um, one in the kitchen for a significant chunk of this holiday season, just to just to blow off some steam. <laughs> Vince, we need that recipe. All right, well you get you get um, some spicy Italian sausage. You brown that first. Then I take about three or four zucchini and then, I don't know, about a pound of mushrooms. And out of the drippings from the uh, from the sausage, you saute those veggies um, for a while until they kind of juice. I like to add that, that like mushroom zucchini broth back into the red sauce. So I do uh, fresh tomato, crushed tomato, a little tomato paste just to kind of help. Even there's some sugar in there. And then you kind of mix all that up together. Um, I actually don't like sauteing the garlic before I throw it into the red sauce. Because if you don't nail the garlic, then it starts to get a little bit bitter. So I kind of just like putting, you know, you know, freshly crushed garlic directly into the red sauce while it's simmering. I kind of like the flavor of that a little bit better. Um, I take some dry basil and just really grind it into the palms of my hands. Like, like real coarse leaf basil. Just smash it in there so you get some good aroma as you're dropping it into the sauce. And then two very liberal pinches of a New Mexican red chili powder. I don't like red pepper flakes, you know, like what you get at a pizzeria. I like the really finely ground New Mexican red chili. You get all that going up in the red sauce. Then the veggies that you are sauteing, you throw that into a mixture of ricotta, parmesan, and uh, I, I do a mix of provolone and mozzarella. And then when you do your layers, it's not just a layer of red sauce with meat and a layer of cheese. It's the, the cheese has these chunks of veggies that also kind of soak up extra flavor. So it, 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 I think it gives a different texture to the noodles in between. Now, the kicker is, and my mom clued me into this one, you don't boil your lasagna noodles. OK, that's the thing that I always bugged me about lasagnas you'd boil these noodles and you try and have to like peel them apart they'd get stuck together they'd start breaking no 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 no. you take those lasagna noodles and you just soak them in in warm water not hot water not boiling water you soak them for about 10 minutes and then all of the moisture in the lasagna is going to finish off the noodles when it's baking and then it also kind of helps keep your lasagna from getting too runny or too liquidy the, the lasagna noodles actually soak up all of that. And then when you let your lasagna settle, like because you're not supposed to cut in as soon as it's out of the oven. Is when you let that lasagna settle, you cut these perfect slices and it comes out like looking like it was shot for a magazine cover. It's so good. So anyway, um, that was uh, that was my cooking <laughs> experimentation, dabbling with a little Italian. <laughs> <laughs> DJ Mama Bagnell with some lasagna hacks. I'm telling you that that noodle trick changed my life. Um, now, whenever I'm going to do any kind of baked or casserole um, style dish with pasta, I'm not going to finish off the pasta. I'm not going to actually boil it and cook it. I'm not even going to like try and go for al dente. I'm just going to go, you know, soak it, let it get a little soft, but then right into the dish and let it, you know, kind of soak up whatever uh, whatever it's being cooked with. <laughs> ah, so, um, yes, that was that that was my sort of Christmas to New Year's. We did a pozole, we did tamales, we did a big old fatty lasagna, and then just lots of leftovers, and it was pretty great. In ER 1980, I had lasagna last night. Absolutely lovely. Um, from Haiti, an evening in Juan's kitchen. You know, after we after we uh, shuttered. The uh, the movie review show. When was that? Back in twenty late twenty eleven, early twenty twelve. Um, we we actually did want to jump on a foodie show, where it'd be like trying out just crazy crockpot and you know stovetop recipes and stews and you know some of our favorite local cuisine from New Mexico, and then also going out to like do restaurant challenges. So I really wanted to do like a best of L.A. 
you get two people and you usher the challenge and you're like, uh, who has the best corn dog in LA? And one person is, is advocating for one restaurant and another person is advocating for a different restaurant. They go to each other's restaurants and then they come back and argue. I wanted to do that show so bad. Oh, it would have been great. <laughs> Ooh, Dave Burns. Everyone, we're going over to uh, to David's house for dinner as he's making General Tso's with Jasmine Rice. So uh, everyone show up. I'm sure he'll make enough for, for everyone to share with everyone. I think it's going to be good times over, in, over at his house. Except for Aditya, I need to lose 15 kilograms. One visit to the USA visiting Sam and Juan's kitchen will help, will help me regain all of that. <laughs> um... I eat a lot. Yeah. I'm 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 fighting it right now. Just, you know, I'm not exercising like I should be with all of the quarantine and the lockdown. Um so yeah, we're gonna have to get on that in twenty twenty one. So uh yes, uh New Year's we're going a little stir crazy. I do I, I'm I'm a little sensitive for my daughter just because you know, she didn't get to play with any kids for like two weeks. Um, and we're we're looking at the the scariness of going back to in person school in person classes. And I'm just hoping I'm hoping the other parents uh, kind of kept up with their quarantining and the parents that decided to travel for the holidays. I'm hoping they keep their kids home for a while just to see if you know any of any of them picked up any bugs or any gremlins or asymptomatic. Um, it's uh, it's heady stuff. So. Definitely appreciate those of you out there that you know, maybe had a rough go of it this holiday season. E even for things being what they were, my wife and I, we worked really hard to uh, to try and find some fun things to do and to try and still keep a festive energy. And it, it was. It was a little exhausting. It was a lot of work. Um, and I'm not sure we completely succeeded, but at least we've got photos and videos that when we look back on this 10 years from now, we can say like, oh... That was still kind of fun. Remember the fun things that we did instead of all of the anxiousness and the anxiety that we had surrounding the world at large. Um, it, it is kind of incredible what you can do to memories <laughs> with a little photographic and video evidence to kind of reprogram what uh, uh, what what your feels might be um, looking back. Uh, from ER1980, I noticed TK was doing a live gaming stream earlier, saw it pop up, was, but was working at the time. I wonder how it went. Uh, TK is, you know, and this is the thing, me and TK, we've been talking about trying to do regular content and more streaming content and more podcasting. And that's definitely one of the things that we're looking at in 2021. 2020, um, I, I would say starting in 2019, uh, I, I felt like there was this existential crisis from a number of my content creator friends. Um, some some people handled it really well. Some people really struggled. There, there, some people kind of leaned into uh, what was popular for YouTube. Some really bucked those trends. It, it's, a, it's a really broad and wide open playing field right now where um, a lot of us don't really know. We don't know what this next year is going to look like for content. 2020 was a difficult year to get through, and we still have some significant challenges facing us, e even without the threat of shelter in place or quarantining or, you know, work at home or school at home types of situations. Um, there, there's still a substantial amount of unknown and a, a lot of work that needs to get done uh, this coming year. And, and it's tricky stuff to handle. You know, it's really difficult to kind of wrap your brain around. So um, uh, why don't why don't we kind of <laughs> DTNL one versus TK among us showdown? Well, we are planning on doing a game night soon. Uh, after we're done with this podcast uh, on the Patreon, I'm going to put together another game game night post because I, I have completely failed at keeping up with the regular game nights that I wanted to do. Uh, especially over the holidays, just trying to find the time to host uh, another game stream just was a bridge too far for my mental well-being and my sanity. But again, getting to do another Patreon live stream, um, 
I, I really need to be checking in more often and it's kind of good for my soul <laughs> to, to talk to some other people and, and to hang out and do some fun stuff. So I'm thinking Among Us is going to be our next game night. Um, just fun, casual party game, lots of yelling and shouting and accusations and frustrations. And, and it's an easy game to get like eight people in a room you know, if, if uh, we, we can uh, kind of kind of join that that online player activity. Um, Aditya Anil, that is an interesting idea, having a chess tournament for game night. I really want to try and do like a poker night too, um, where maybe for the Patreon, we could we could put something up, you know, like a, maybe I've got like an LGG3. <laughs> you know, the stakes are really high, but whoever wins that poker night is walking away with a, with a, with a G2 with, you know, a battery that doesn't charge. <laughs> but yeah, so what we at least just got to get another game night going. And from there, then we'll, we'll, we'll figure out where else we can take it. You know, 2021, my new year's resolution is getting back on track for some of that more regular community content. Um, I, I have two or three unfinished, uh, uh, I call them production diaries, just like behind the scenes on how I make stuff. You know, like it's stupid. I just need to finish those. So over the last couple of weeks, um, I've had a, a few videos go out. Obviously, uh, we talked about Die Hard as a Christmas movie and how everyone is wrong if they don't think Die Hard is a Christmas movie. But I, I wanted to close out 2020 with a very specific kind of conversation about phones. And so just as uh, the little bit of housekeeping we can do here, um, my, my assertion is there was no phone of the year in 2020. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like phones were so terrible, no one phone was good. Um, I mean, exactly the opposite. That phones were so competitive over 2020 that I think it was kind of silly. I think it was kind of silly to try and sum up this this last year with best of awards or with, um, you know, like uh, categories, you know, this was the best camera phone. All of that stuff is nonsense. I really feel like 2020 showed us, I think one of the best examples I've ever seen of specialized hardware, daily driver options, and phone categories that really lined up with specific people's needs. Where you could genuinely get the exact right fit phone for you and that there were very good options at a variety of price tiers. If you wanted a more productivity focused device, but you didn't want to spend a lot of money, there were amazing options to enable better multitasking, better document support, stylus uh, support. Those things that we would normally only point to a Galaxy Note could be achieved at much lower prices um, or with just a greater variety of, of, of offerings. Even that by itself, you know, it used to be there was one phone that supported a stylus. That, that was your choice. This last year, we saw phenomenal competition. So uh, again, it's a video that I hope people watch and I hope people share. It goes hand in hand. I did that Thanksgiving video just talking about the tech I was most thankful for. And then I did a video talking about different phone categories where I'm really tired of, is it a budget phone, a mid-ranger, or a flagship? Is this a flagship phone? Is it a flagship phone from a budget company, or is it a flagship phone from a premium company? Like, these words don't mean anything anymore. But if I talk about a communicator phone versus a multimedia phone, or if I talk about a gaming phone versus a productivity handset, you know, someone brought up in the comments just yesterday, like, what if we talked about privacy phones? What about making a category of phones that the core kernel of what makes that phone interesting is better privacy settings? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that kind of a conversation because I feel more consumers are included when we stop talking about phones as just generic price tiers. Because generic price tiers mean nothing. They, they are not insightful at all tell me what a mid-ranger is and I'll tell you how you're wrong. <laughs> and then, you know, you say something like mid-ranger and what does that mean for someone's budget? You know, someone might budget $400 for a phone. Is that still technically a mid-ranger? You can buy a phone for $2,000. $400 is no longer the midpoint 
of the price spectrum for phones. So, um, yeah, I'm going to take another sip of water here. Uh, <laughs> Matt Tyler, someone should have done an app of the year because we've all been locked up. Oof. I can't even imagine what, like, you know, this was the best app of 2020. Really? Really? Uh, the other major video that I put out recently was kind of capping out one of the last uh, hashtag 2020 hearing videos of 2020. This is a series I'm going to continue um, through 2021, even though I'm still going to keep calling it 2020 hearing because I like the pun. Um, but uh it was it was just a I needed to talk about something other than like, you know, smartphone benchmarks and reviews and stuff. And so I wanted to see. Uh, well, first, I, I heard about the update for Google's sound amplifier, and it's an app that uses your phone microphones to enhance what you hear through a Bluetooth headset. And I was thinking like, oh, well, this is just like live listen on the iPhone. And uh it's so much better than live listen on the iPhone. Um, live listen works if you have AirPods or Beats, and that's it. And all it does is fire up the mics on your phone and send a louder signal to your AirPods. That can be a little helpful. I mean, if you just need a little extra hearing assistance and something that's a little bit louder or a little more boosted, that's fine. Live listen can help with that. Uh, Google Sound Amplifier is an actual noise reduction platform. So you can dial in specific noise reduction settings and then use your phone's microphones to send to any headset, wired or wireless. It's not like this only works with Pixel Buds. Oh, and TK's in the chat. Everyone say, hey, TK. Um, <laughs> so... Um, uh, yeah, sorry. It, it's like I had to play around with it a little bit more. I even did a live sample where because I can send it out through um, uh, through a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, I can play in real time what this sounds like when I use it on a V60. Um, it, it's really interesting and it's free software and it's like noise reduction for your conversations. It's 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 interesting. It's a step in a direction that I hope we can travel more. So. Um, that was the other major video I put out over these last uh, over these this last week or so. So um, two two main videos. I've been a little light on the channel. I'm going to be catching back up, getting back up to speed, and hopefully being able to talk through a few more of these videos as my voice tries to hold out. But um, yeah, I'm really curious. I, I'm I'm very anxious to see how 2021 plays out. There are a lot of things that I kind of need to address on my channel, and then also. Where do we go? What do we do? What do we talk about? What do we want? I'm just, um, yeah, like I said, anxious, I think is the right word. Where, where, where we're going and what we might need to do. Ah. Uh, from Aditya, I do believe that the tech that blurs the line between hearing aid and consumer tech is an untapped market. We need more tech there and more coverage of said tech. And I completely agree because hearables are kind of cool. Um, and Matt Tyler, I know they're not hearing related, but the Bose sleep buds really need more attention. And that was one I was kind of curious to check out. I'm very squirrely about like earbuds your, or any type of audio solution you might wear while you're asleep. Um, so lots of, uh, I've got a few stories here, not lots. I've got a few stories here that I do want to cover. Um, everything that we're going to be talking about can obviously be found on uh, the show notes for this week's episode on somegadgetguy.com. Um, Nick Fells is, is highlighting a message. I'd love to see revisits of older phones, stuff from like 2015. Is it viable to daily a five-year-old phone, a five-year-old flagship or a five-year-old mid-ranger? So I am planning, um, it's, it's not quite five years I want to say it's like it's getting on four, but I am so tired of gadget nerds who only can occupy like a flavor of chipset. And that's like I, I call them the chipset cheapskates. Um, 
<clears throat> or or who kind of parrot this, well, I mean, I've got to buy this caliber phone because I'm so afraid of, you know, when the phone is like five years old, you can't use any apps on it. And, and Matt Tyler, that's correct. Nerds. Um, you know, you screw, those of you who are watching, and there are like 50 people watching right now, I'm, I'm not too worried about y'all. I'm still going to make this video. It probably won't be immediately in the next week, so people will forget, and I can come back to it at my leisure. Um, I, I want to take the very first phone I ever got to use with the Snapdragon 625. And I feel like the 625 was the turning point. Um, the 614, that, that era 614, 615, was there a Snapdragon 615? I don't remember. But the 614 was an adequate daily driver experience. And I really remember picking that up on an old Moto G series and going like, okay, a lot of compromises here, but if I only ever needed to like check my email and occasionally pull up Facebook, like I could live with the 614. When I got the very first Huawei Nova, and it had a 625, I was pissy about that phone when I saw the specs. Then I started using that phone, and I felt like there were almost no compromises on that phone compared to much, much more expensive devices using top-of-the-line chipsets. So I've, I've dug out my Huawei Nova, my original first-gen Huawei Nova, and I want to give it a run. It shoots 4K video. It had a good chipset. I want to see what the radios are kind of like. If I get any kind of reception in this terrible area for LTE coverage. And um, and I'm purposely looking at that. Because I'm, and someone mentioned like a Huawei P9 or, or you know, like you know, an older flagship. And I totally understand that. But I want to attack this at this conversation where people are just so concerned I'm so concerned about a Snapdragon 765 because what happens in a year? What happens in a year when that chipset is is out of date and and you know software gets more demanding and updates? What happens? I've got so many pearls to clutch. And I'm telling you, my expectations are actually very high because I had such huge fondness for that Huawei, for that Huawei Nova. Um I'm going to be curious, like, does, does it still kind of live up to what my feelings of that, of that period were? And I, I want to say, I want to say the Huawei Nova was four, it might have been like about four years ago. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to a phone like that and purposely going to the mid range because I want to dispel this idea that somehow we're lacking compute power in the mid range for average consumers to get by in three years. It's so, it's so silly. Um, my, uh, I, I missed your, hold on. I've got to scroll back up. Nick had a comment and it was good. Where did it go? Do, do. <laughs> Um, also curious is how far can you update the Nova? So I don't think you can update it much. I think it got one major operating system update from when it originally launched. So what I'm also going to be looking at, though, is does the Google Play services help catch it up? Because I think we're right on the border where it should be, it should get nearby share. Um, that's one of the major differences that I, I, I kind of also feel like I need to point out are older Android phones don't get major operating system updates, right? You can count on OS updates on iPhones for like four or five years. But when was the last time you saw a major feature update like nearby share? I mean, something that is a fundamentally new service go to a five-year-old iPhone. I mean, it took two over two years to get my iPhone XS would just just to update and polish up the camera app and they didn't give that phone a night mode even though that hardware totally could have handled some type of low light mode photography that phone was dead for new features after a year but nearby share through google play services was extended i think all the way back to android 6 
So we've got to be able to fairly compare this kind of stuff when we complain, oh, Androids don't get updates. Yeah, but they do. They kind of do. It's just different. And that's not bad. We just got to make sure our expectations are in check. <laughs> yeah, and Dave Burns, bad, min bad mid rangers really burned the markets for years. It will take uh, time to recover from the OG6 series. But that's also what our job is. Um, as uh, you know, on my side of this camera, uh, my side of this conversation, techies, tech influencers, tech reviewers, whatever you want to call us, our job is to actually look at that stuff, not go, oh, but it's a mid ranger chipset, so it can't be goods enough for the monies. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this only has a Snapdragon 855, even though I only use apps that could totally be handled by a Snapdragon 460. It's not good enough. <laughs> and a DTNL, my SD845 is completely fine. It's the battery that's killing my usage. Um, I'm on perma battery saver mode on my old G7. And yeah, yeah, I get that. I, I for reals get that. Oh, and Matt Tyler um, gifted a tier one sub to ER1980. Thank you so much for supporting production, man. I, I missed the actual little notification pop-up or I would have given you that thumbs up. Thank you in the chat. Um, Nick Fell, isn't the main issue with not getting OS updates that eventually apps won't support your old OS? Yeah, that's fine. I know that when I tried to revive my HTC One, shipped with 4.5 when 8 was new and it wouldn't connect to services at all. Um, yes, but what we've also seen is the cutoff for most Android supported services, I believe is Android 6 now. So if we wanna look back at a phone that's five years old, especially for people in this chat saying they wanted me to look back at phones that were around five years old, that's kind of where we're at. We're on Android 11, I'd be looking at Android 6, Android 7 to see if any of this stuff is still functional. <laughs> from McCorkerin, Stadia will run on Android 7. <laughs> I think if we're trying to cover what these gadgets are really capable of, we should still have fairly broad support, especially considering, I mean, the, the bulk of the market, Android 11 won't even hit serious double digit market share until Android 12 is out, right? So... It's a, it's a different kind of operating system generational spread in Android land. Uh, all right. Uh, why don't we get into some news? We've got a, a handful of news stories here. It's already 930 in the AM. <laughs> I'm way off my flow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Let me get this over here. So, uh... Sorry, Dave Burns is coming here. Now, just hear me out on this one. User replaceable batteries. Just a thought. <laughs> okay, so um, some news stories that I want to keep an eye on. Just some headlines that kind of grabbed me over the last couple weeks. Uh, especially trying to get back into tech news and tech politics. One of the concerns I've, I've had... Um, the, the future of sort of the economy that surrounds consumer electronics needs to start accounting for better labor practices, and it also needs to account better for end of life. My, our last, like the pajama podcast, I kind of went off on a little bit of a rant. Part of the cost of your device is what happens to that device when you throw it away. And I don't feel the prices for manufacturing that device always reflect um, what happens to that gadget when it's when it's dead, when it's time to throw it away? Um, you know, we can try and recycle. We can try and put up initiatives like take it to a recycling center. But it's silly. It's silly that the products don't get recycled because it's often an, an additional consumer expense to recycle that product. So one of the other things that kind of contributes or or makes a product seem like a better deal or a better buy is how the product was created. So after we had kind of our rant or conversation about um, disposing of electronics, the, the tsunami of e-waste that's being created, 
Um, our right to repair legislation that's constantly getting um, contested by major manufacturers like Apple. It's a real bad look when on New Year's Eve, we catch headlines like this where Apple knew a supplier was using child labor but took three years to fully cut ties despite the company's promise to hold itself to the, quote, highest standards. Um, this is coming by way of Business Insider by Tyler Sonnemaker. Apple is back under the spotlight under labor conditions in its supply chain following an explosive report from the information on Thursday that revealed new details about the company's reluctance to cut ties with suppliers who violate its ethics policy. According to the report, Apple learned in 2013 that Suyin Electronics, a China-based company that at the time made parts for its MacBooks, was employing underage workers, and despite telling Suyin to address the issue or risk losing business, Apple discovered additional workers as young as 14 years old during an audit just three months later. But rather than immediately cutting ties with Su Yin for uh, violating its supply chain ethics policy, which prohibits child labor and which Apple claims are the, quote, highest standards, Apple continued to rely on the company for more than three years, according to the information. So, you know, like, really it was Apple just waited until the kids were of age. Yeah, that that that's the ticket. So this is an extremely difficult problem to untangle. But I feel it's a bad look because earlier in the year, and it was a story that I don't think I really covered on the podcast. I probably should have, but I, I didn't read up on it as well as I, I, I wanted to, to kind of dig into the meat and potatoes of it. But Apple was one of the companies, uh, I, excuse me, a lobbyist on behalf of Apple was a, uh, uh, Late in late in 2020, and I want to say it was about a month ago, um, a lobbyist on behalf of Apple was lobbying against a new piece of legislation which would have made business practices like this illegal. You know, it would have made sh it, it would have put additional burdens on manufacturers like Apple to audit and maintain a supply chain that did not use child labor. This is a phenomenally difficult problem to correct for. When we talk about the global economy and how subcontractors of subcontractors of subcontractors are responsible for fulfilling these tiny little parts and pieces all the way down to whether or not rare earth elements are being extracted through child labor. It is not easy, but I feel like sending a lobbyist to Washington, D.C. to oppose legislation that would start to try and correct for this prod problem a month before it's revealed that you've spent years working with supply part uh, supply and and parts distribution services that employ child labor that's not a great look so yes we we can look at apple as a premium manufacturer of consumer electronics and know that one of the things that like Apple is known for is extracting as much value out of every single consumer interaction that they can. That is how they became one of the most profitable entities around, one of the most profitable companies in the consumer electronics space. And while they can talk a huge game about holding themselves to the highest standards. We have investigated ourselves at Apple and we have found that we hold ourselves to the highest standard. This is one of the ways that your company can make more money. This is one of the ways that you can cut costs. This is one of the ways that you can do business to maintain a profit margin. And unfortunately, it's not unique to Apple. This is a systemic issue with the entire supply chain of parts, pieces, resources, minerals, and management. And starting to get a handle on this, it, it can't be grassroots, you know? I'd, I wanna say like, well, if you're upset about Apple using child labor to manufacture, you know, their electronics, just, just go to Samsung. I'm in extremely concerned that if any parts or pieces are, are utilized through a similar type of, of product chain, you can't just escape what Apple, the, the same trap Apple fell into. It's just too profitable to do business with certain companies and just 
hopefully have some kind of plausible deniability that you don't exactly know how those companies do business. So if, if we don't combat this from a political stance, there isn't really a true free market solution to this because the market has spoken. The market says we want companies to be more profitable and consumers want cheaper electronics. So the market is going to fulfill those two demands with one course of action. Unfortunately, I feel, you know, being the, the leftist that I am, we need some other type of influence on the market to prevent this type of business practice. Ah. <laughs> uh. <sighs> And from Matt Tyler, Top Gear witnessed babies building roads. So I think the problem is deeper than we care to admit here in the West. And, and this is where, like, you know, when we were having you know, problems with energy, when we were having issues with the Middle East or where do we get our oil from, even though I was kind of a perpetually broke 20-year-old, I would have paid more at the pump to know that the gas I was buying was coming from Canada limit the supply, and charge me more for the inconvenience of maintaining oil and fuel from different locations. But I would have paid more. I mean, think of America after 9-11. How many people in the United States would have paid 10 cents a gallon more, 20 cents a gallon more for freedom gas? You know, like, there, there's a way to do this. There's a way to appeal not only to our, our higher instincts, you know, our, our higher selves, but then also our capitalist selves at the same time. And, and I'm, I'm just I'm just frustrated because it, it, it takes some will. It takes some fortitude. Um, but I would pay more for a phone that I knew was assembled in Detroit. You know, I would pay more for a laptop that I knew was built in Texas. I, I want that sticker on the box and I want it to mean something. I, I would even be willing to excuse you know, certain product lines having slightly less consistent QA. If I knew it was like coming out of Vermont or something like, I don't know if Vermont has any kind of manufacturing industry. I don't think it does. Um, but but it, it's sad that we don't try to to entertain that conversation for long. We put up token eff uh, efforts, we, we put up like feel good marketing and that's about as much as anyone really cares, uh, cares to accomplish. Uh, from Nick Fell highlighting this, the absolute worst part is that this is a pick your poison sort of deal. Frequently the economic circum circumstances of the labor class in third world countries rely on child labor income to make ends meet just like before child labor was outlawed in the US would require every company contracting labor in a region to make this distinction as well as an effort on the region's government to solve the problem. And that's true, but I feel like the first step is getting after our own government, right? There's, there's got to be a starting point. You're, not, you're, you're completely correct that we don't solve the issue until every part of this is sort of working together to find solutions, and it never completely goes away. And that's the other thing, too, is we have to acknowledge that this will be a perpetual problem. But because we know it's a perpetual problem, we don't just shrug our shoulders and say, oh, it's going to be hard. We dig in. We, we talk to our elected officials. We write angry letters to the PR departments and HR departments at, at the manufacturers that we enjoy their products. We find out that they've stepped afoul of an issue like this. We make the effort. And then, you know, we, it, it's so hack to say, but then we vote with our wallets. We actually need to make this a story that impresses upon people that where they put their dollars matters. And it takes time. And it's, it's not going to be fixed overnight. It probably won't even be significantly corrected for in the next 10 years. But if, you know, the best time to start would have been, you know, like in the 1980s, the second best time to start is today, correcting for market trends that now we would consider not good. Uh, 
Ah. <laughs> uh. From Dave Burns, I feel like we avoid doing anything because we never have the best solution, but continue to let things get to get worse anyway. And again, yeah, and that's I completely agree there where uh, perfect is the enemy of better. <laughs> we could be doing something better. And, and it sucks because like I want to be able to look my daughter in the eye when she has kids and say like, hey, daddy's job when you were a little girl depended on talking a lot and 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 sort of promoting a digital lifestyle it's um it's heady stuff it, it definitely gives me pause on what it is that we're doing how we're talking about it and what our expectations should be a dt no grandpa one is a long time away not that long man not that long i, I mean i i hope for a while but like Let's say it's 20 years. That's not that long. That that's that's a, a a good chunk of someone's life, but it's not that long. All right. Um this one uh uh this this one kind of took me a little bit by surprise. I completely did not catch this. This actually came from Dave Burns um on the uh on the Discord um when I was just kind of putting out a call for different articles. It, it's not too deep of a it's a curious situation, but it's not too deep of one to get into. Um, DJI is now on the U.S. entity list. Uh, this is the article from Uber Gizmo, originally reported on by Reuters, uh, but written up by Tyler Lee. Um, so the U.S. Uh, government has placed – actually, you just read this from the article. The U.S. government has since placed DJI on its entities list. The same list that Huawei is currently on, and this spells trouble for the drone maker as they might have some issues finding parts for its products. Um, but this was the interesting paragraph to me. Uh, that being said, DJI's placement on the list isn't due to national security reasons, but according to the Commerce Department, it is over alleged human rights issues where DJI, AG, AGCU, Scientec, China National Scientific Instruments and Materials, and Quang Chi Group, quote, enabled wide-scale human rights abuses within China through abusive genetic collection and analysis or high technology surveillance. I am a little conflicted. I mean again, I, I've I've been a little been a little twitchy about Huawei being on this entity list and and for there being this claimed threat of network surveillance and building backdoors to China with no, or I should say very little substantial proof of those allegations being shared with consumers. Whether or not the evidence is there, we've seen very little evidence of it. And I feel like the corrections that should have been levied at Huawei, I, I don't feel they should have been as severe as what we saw this last presidential administration enact. Um, you know, from from the P P10 Pro days all the way to today, I find the timeline of this threat allegation to be curious. I'm even more anxious about DJI being put on this list under allegations of surveillance in China. So let's say DJI was responsible for manufacturing drones that enabled state surveillance in China. I'm not sure why that would put them on a hostile entity list for consumer electronics in the United States. I'm unclear, and I haven't been able to dig into that. I've gone through about four different articles on this, on, on this topic with DJI. And I'm still not clear what our government's position on this company is for how that company might do business regionally in China. So I would like some clarification. This is definitely one I want us to keep an eye on. And I'm putting the call out there. If anyone you know catches another follow up or another news story, what's going on with this type of of uh, commerce department action, you know, uh, shoot me a tweet. Um, because I find it to be a curious correction for how companies do business in different regions. 
we don't like how you might have supplied the Chinese government with hardware, so we're not going to give you access to consumers in North America. I'm grossly oversimplifying there. I know I am. There has to be more than that. Or at least I would hope so. So if anyone catches something, please let me know. So um, I'm, I'm not... I really don't get how this one is supposed to work. With Huawei, it sort of made sense with telecommunications equipment. That was the perceived threat. DJI, I mean, they make they make little drones. I mean, like, I mean, I suppose unless there's an argument to be made that like every video you shoot with your drone is sent to a server in China, which would be very easy to demonstrate the security problems there. Um, you know, like if a Mavic is trying to upload for your 4K video of your flyover at the coast uh, to a server in mainland China, I think we'd notice. So I'm not sure what what we're what we're looking at here or what the threat to the United States is for DJI's involvement in in Chinese surveillance. <laughs> From Elisna, the tech dystopia is upon us. <laughs> All right. Um, th this one was kind of an, another interesting story. I think we just need to keep an eye on it. Um, again, I am the the cranky liberal leftist tech nerd, so this kind of made me a little a little glimmer of of happiness, a little perk, a little. It would be nice to see a trend like this maybe build up a bit more momentum. Um, hundreds of Google employees unionized, culminating years of activism. Uh, this was written up by Kate Conger at the New York Times. More than 225 Google engineers and other workers have formed a union. The group revealed on Monday, capping years of growing activism at one of the world's largest companies and presenting a rare beachhead for labor organizers in staunchly anti-union Silicon Valley. The union's creation is highly unusual for the tech industry, which has long resisted efforts to organize its largely white-collar workforce. It follows increasing demands by employees at Google for policy overhauls on pay, harassment, and ethics, and is likely to escalate tensions with top leadership. The new union, called the Alphabet Workers Union, after Google's parent company Alphabet, was organized in secret for the better part of a year and elected its leadership last month. The group is affiliated with the Communication Workers of America, a union that represents workers in telecoms and media in the United States and Canada. But unlike a traditional union which demands that an employer come to the bargaining table to agree on a contract, the Alphabet Workers Union is a so-called minority union that represents a fraction of the company's more than 260,000 full-time employees and contractors. Workers said it was primarily an effort to give structure and longevity to activism at Google rather than to negotiate for a contract. So it could be interesting. We've seen so many of those stories like Google employees are upset about, you know, depart def uh, defense department initiatives. Uh, Google employees are upset about uh, policy with doing business in China. Google employees are upset about the retention efforts for uh, minority and female coders. Having some type of collected group, even if it's kind of a fringe or a faction at Google, um, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like this might be a step in the right direction. I'm kind of tired of all those stories like, Every Facebook engineer that leaves Facebook suddenly has all of these terrible things to say about the company. Enacting change within a company seems to only be capable if you're a shareholder. So if you're a millionaire and you own stock in a company, you can tell that company what to do. If you work for the company, it seems your efforts to guide that company policy are far less valuable to the top brass which makes sense, you know, in a capitalistic society where we we want to uh, sort, of, sort of push the value of a corporation, the people who invest and put their money into that have a, a greater value at the discussion of what that company should do. But that doesn't mean that the humans involved at the ground floor aren't a part of what makes those products and services function, and they might have some concerns over how their work is being utilized. That conversation should be a part 
of how that company functions. <laughs> DTNL, some gadget comrade. I'm even wearing my, my red flat cap. Um, it's not a beret. People keep saying I wear a beret. It's not a beret. It's a flat cap. It's technically a Tropico. <laughs> Oh, and my tech review says he just found an article on DJI saying that uh, the government have them on the list for violation of human rights for surveillance. Now, I, I understand that. I mean, that was a part of the article that I just shared. I mean, I literally read that, you know, they're, they're, they're on this list because of human rights violations and state surveillance. But what I'm unclear on is why the entities list is created for how a business like DJI supplies a government with hardware like the Chinese government, where it's like cameras and drones. Curious. Again, I, I want to hear something from our State Department or our Commerce Department that digs into that just a little bit more. <laughs> Matt Tyler, name a colored hat that one doesn't own. Well, I'm wearing red today, bucko. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I don't know how this will affect policy at Google, how it will affect the corporate culture at Google. But I, I think it's I think it could be good for Google. You know, um, some guidance from the ground up as opposed to always listening from the top down, especially in the middle of so many of these companies under investigation from the United States government, antitrust allegations, uh, maybe having people on the floor, on the ground floor of your operation guiding the policy could be a good thing for this company if it's run maybe just a touch more democratically than it has been in the past. Especially for those of us that like to make jokes about Google's old slogan about not being evil. Um, you know, a little self-reflection from your company employees, maybe not a bad idea. Uh, another story that I, I thought was just kind of fun. Um, quick, quick show of hands in the live chat as I'm going to drink another drink of water here. Uh, what processor is in your main daily driver personal sim card phone what what who who made that processor ready ready go dave burns has an 855 so he has a qualcomm uh dank pickman has a qualcomm dave burns uh, saying qualcomm warhead has a qualcomm uh jmx warrior has a qualcomm uh, Hakey has a Qualcomm. Nick Fell has an Exynos. We've got one Exynos. Simon says Hypno has a Kirin. So we've got one Exynos, one Kirin, two Kirins. Um, TK Bay has a MediaTek. So now we're up to four different manufacturers. I was just a little tickled. How many times have I gone off the nerdy deep end of competition, right? I, I, it's like the main talking point in my reviews, you know, finding the right fit for the right person, blah, 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 blah. But no product or service gets better unless we've got good competition. Apple is showing us this with the M1. If you're not an Apple fan, you should be very excited about the M1 because it's going to light a fire under AMD. And then hopefully that fire will kind of spread to Intel. It could happen. <laughs> Simon says Hypno saying, a few times you've mentioned some stuff like that. So uh, you know, imagine my glee when we saw the headline that for third quarter 2020, Q3 2020, MediaTek dethrones Qualcomm to become the biggest smartphone chipset vendor. Year over year... Let's see, I've got the, gar the graph right here. So in 2019, MediaTek was 26% of the SOC market. Qualcomm was 31. Uh, High Silicon, which is, they make the Kirin for Huawei, was 12%. Samsung was 16%. Apple was 11%. And Unisoc, I have, I've never used anything Unisoc, um, was 3%. It seems... A bunch of these companies whittled away at Samsung and Qualcomm. In Q3 2020, MediaTek was 31%. They jumped 5% on 
in uh, the number of, of uh, devices shipped. Qualcomm uh, also shrank to 29%. Samsung shrank from 16 to 12. Apple grew from 11 to 12. And Unisoc grew from 3 to 4%. So it's like everyone kind of leached off of Samsung and Qualcomm to kind of build up their, uh, their, their margins here. 31% of phones sold in the third quarter of 2020 had MediaTek chipsets. And why was that? Certainly wasn't because of the high end. We're not talking Dimensity 1000s here. We're talking all of the phones in the sort of $300 and under tier. And that's where MediaTek has been dominating as a price performance option against Qualcomm's offerings. And that is is crazy exciting. So I got to play with the Dimensity finally. I've got it in my T-Mobile variant of the Velvet, and it's a great chipset. The the camera um, signal processing, I think Qualcomm is just a little bit ahead. You know, you look at the Velvet with the Snapdragon versus the Velvet with the Dimensity. I think the Snapdragon still wins some camera showdowns, but the Velvet with the Dimensity has got beefier graphics. So you can make these trades. Like maybe you want to game a little bit more on a phone, and you, you know, maybe someone else wants to take better photos. You know, those types of differences, that kind of showdown, it's really exciting. So looking at competition just made me happy. Made me happy to see that Huawei held steady. The Kirin is at 12%, stayed at 12%. It's not that I'm wanting Qualcomm to do poorly, but I bet you seeing this type of fight where MediaTek grew year over year substantially, a 5% jump in this kind of market is insane. We're talking about millions of devices out there. I'm betting you we're going to start seeing some Qualcomm powered handsets at around $300 that are going to be far more capable than what we got a year or two ago. And that is crazy exciting for competition. That's exactly what we want to see. When Qualcomm just gets to just gets to hold court, when they just sort of rule and no one else has anything to compete with, we don't get better products. The, the products get stagnant. Now with competition, I'm expecting 2021, especially once we get into like the second half of 2021 and we start seeing the refresh from this, this last generation of chipsets, that's where I'm thinking we're going to start seeing some crazy competitive hardware. You know, if it's a seven, I don't know what it's going to be called, but the follow up to the 765, the follow up that I'm using on the 690. And then maybe uh, I think they just announced a 480. Is it the 480 that's the first 400 series with a 5G radio? That's where this stuff is going to get real exciting. From Al Spockley. Oh, one Apple user out of the lot. <clears throat> but they they were on an, an A14. So it's like that one Apple user can take like four of you Android people in a performance showdown, right? Processing power to processing power. Ah. Uh. Yeah, Simon says Hypno, the P40's Pro, uh, P40 Pro is 990. That's a great chip. Um, I'm trying to think. I think the P20 was my last Huawei. I really do need to uh, to try and catch up with a Huawei this year. <laughs> oh, there's a second person in here with an A14. They just didn't want to speak up about it. You know, they, they are on an A14. They don't need to brag. What is this? Marilyn Merrill Link P? Mary Link P? Merrill Link? I don't know. I don't know how to say her name. Um, also on an A14. So, you know, you could have joined your Apple brethren and supported the cause, but you chose not to. And that's fine. It's okay. You don't need to brag. <laughs> because the last story on this, especially talking about A14 users hiding in the chat, um, from from the Apple perspective, this, is, this was a great story. I actually got, like, some retweet action from the analyst that put this together. Um, this is from Flurry looking at the activations over Christmas uh, for 2020. Apple iPhone devices sweep nine of the top 10 devices on Christmas 2020. 
Um, smartphone activations on Christmas Day 2019 versus 2020. We saw a 23% drop. But of the uh, the top top 10, nine of those top 10 were Apple devices. Uh, who, who maybe has? Um, oh, why is this not? Hold on. I'm going to refresh this. Let me see if I can get. There we go. The bar graph like disappeared. I was going to try and be cheeky about it. Like, what was the one Android? But you know me, what kind of show I run. Of course, it's an LG. Of course, the number 10 most activated device on Christmas Day was an LG. Because you didn't hear about that. It was like, oh, nine of the top 10 were Apples. Okay. Did, was Samsung number 10? No, they were not. <laughs> And I mean, it's a cheap LG, the K30. What What is the K30? Is that the one with the Snapdragon 450? I mean, it's it's one of those like super uh, inexpensive uh, budget options from LG. The K series are actually pretty cute, but I think you can pick them up here in the United States for like half a ham sandwich and a hearty handshake. Um, back to their chart. One of the things that was also critical, critical, the, the, you know, when we're looking at the list of iPhones, every single year we play this game and every single year tech influencers try and talk about average consumers with $1,000 phones. But far and away, the most activated phone on Christmas Day was the iPhone 11. Not the iPhone 11 Pro, not the iPhone 11 Pro Max, the iPhone 11. Second place, iPhone 10R. Not a 2019 phone, a 2018 iPhone. You have to crawl into third place before you get the iPhone 12 Pro Max, then the iPhone 12, then the 11, the iPhone 11 Pro Max, then the iPhone SE, and then the iPhone 12 Pro. And then rounding out the, the uh, eighth and ninth spots and the iPhone 8 Plus and the iPhone 8. And then we go from the iPhone 8 to nearly the same sales numbers for the LG K30. So again, we never, ever need to hear tech reviewers talk about average consumers. Well, I mean, here, here's a $1,000 smartphone, but how will an average person use this phone? I mean, they only just open up Facebook and maybe they take one HDR photo of an awkward thing on their sidewalk. And that's how average people use this phone. Average people buy two-year-old iPhones. Average. Average consumers buy average phones and they shop in the mid-range. And they shop older flagship devices, like several-year-old flagship devices. And even several-year-old mid-range devices. Average consumers are not spending $1,000 on a brand-new device, you know, the week it comes out at full MSRP. That's not a thing. We never, ever need to hear a tech reviewer pontificate on what... You know, what is it like to cover the bare minimum on a phone that's $1,000? And, you know, it's just like the same as any other phone. This phone isn't good enough for the monies because all I did with it was, uh, like, open up Twitter. And it was the same Twitter as I could get on a cheaper phone. You should buy a Samsung. <laughs> like, what is going on? It would be like if you... I mean, I've made this joke before, but I'm just going to say it out loud. It would be like if... You, you you reviewed cars, right? So what kind of car do you have? Well, I have a flagship car. It's a, it's a really good car. It's a flagship car. Okay. Well, like, how do you review a car? Well, most average drivers, they, they only commute in stop and go traffic. So I took the new 2021 Corvette, uh, Corvette, you know, Stingray. And it's an $80,000 flagship car. And so uh, to, to, to use that like average drivers do, um, I just drove through uh, school zones at 15 miles an hour. And it's a really good car. It's a flagship car. So, I mean, it's, it's worth it for the monies because it's a flagship car. And it could go 15 miles an hour in a school zone. 
that's 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 how you review a car is you you boil it down to the the most basic use of regular everyday daily driver average drivers and that's the only thing you're going to talk about you don't push that car to its manufactured limits you don't judge by the manufacturer's claims so if a manufacturer says a car's really fast, well, most average drivers don't go that fast. So you you shouldn't ever test it that way. The folks at Flurry retweeted me making a couple cracks like that. So I felt pretty good about myself. 2021 is going to be another one of them years where uh, I get real cranky pants the way we talk about phones. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, TK had to jump on a call. Oh, I miss getting to say goodbye to TK. Bye, TK. Thanks for dropping by, man. I appreciate it. Um, from Marilink, Mar I, I don't know how I'm supposed to say your name. Mar Mar Marilink's phonetically spell out your name so I can reply to your comments. Um, I finally decided to try an, an uh, iPhone 12 Pro Max because I was able to set it up so I could use it as a dual SIM for those times I don't want to carry two phones. The other one of mine is a Mate 20 Ultra. Um, excuse me. I think actually the 12 Pro Max would be kind of a fun phone to set up for that. Um, I, I just, I don't do as much here in the United States with dual SIM. Um, I'm trying to do a little bit more network coverage and I'm looking like I want to sign up for Visible. Visible is the MVNO. It's a low cost carrier. It's kind of like Google Fi for Verizon. There are so few phones that work with Visible and I really want to use it with like, um, like I've got the LG Wing. I've got the Verizon variant of the LG Wing. I would love to use that and try it out on Visible, not supported. It doesn't matter that it's a Verizon carrier phone. Nope, can't use it on Verizon's MVNO. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of bummed. Nick Fell, to be fair, a car reviewer I know did that sort of thing with trucks. But that's because so many people only use trucks as trucks so rarely and found they all rode like shit. <laughs> Coming from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where you see the like a hard split, it's like old beat up, you know, dually diesel trucks that are, are like used for construction and landscaping and hauling equipment or top of the line like super super duty trucks that like tiny little housewives jump out of while sipping on lattes to go to their pilates classes there's like almost no in in the middle you know it's 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 either like the most expensive options for heavy duty trucks being used by construction guys or being used as like a minivan substitute um i i completely understand you know going into a truck review purposely um, poking at a market demographic of people who don't genuinely use trucks the way they should. But I'm also cranky about smartphone reviewers doing that when they're, they're basically convincing people to lease phones they don't need. You know, again, oh, you want the best. You deserve the bestest phone. So it's okay if you're spending 50 bucks a month for 24 months. You can miss me with, uh, with that kind of reviewer uh uh, strategy it's because it's basically just stroking the YouTube algorithm for your own ad revenue, not actually delivering any kind of useful information for people who might be into this kind of stuff. <laughs> From Hakey, Juan snarky face is snarky. Oh, Matt, Juan doesn't do dual SIM. Matt can't do du dual SIM. I mean, I would want to do dual SIM. It's just like we've got to bounce back and forth between so many different carriers that we can't. It's so frustrating. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, send that useless wing over here, Juan. I mean, without a SIM card, I'm keeping my wing. I'm sorry. I like that phone. It's going to be fun to follow up on that. I'm still waiting for the update because it's a Verizon version. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a... It's going to be the gig. Um, <laughs> from Nick Feld, the difference was that the car reviewer did not recommend the truck for commuting in the end. <laughs> watch, watch someone whip out like a Galaxy Fold 2 review. Galaxy Z Fold 2, three months later. Boy, it's so nice watching Netflix on it. 
I'm glad I spent $2,000 so I could prop up half of the screen to stream some YouTube. Uh, Vomitous. Drives me crazy. Okay. Um, I, let, let's take a quick break. Uh, those were the main news stories. We're going to get into some gadget chat after this. Just real fast. Got to plug the subreddit. Um, we've been we've been keeping up with some fun activity on reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. It's community built to try and help um, share more content from creators and, and on topics that you feel deserve more attention. And especially over the holidays, we saw some really fun. Excuse me. We saw some really fun uh, videos go up and, and especially those that were sort of voted to the top of the subreddit. Um, looking at the last week, let me go into screen share here, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. iPhone 12 Pro Max one month later took the top spot coming from Tech PhD, who has recently broken 1,000 subscribers. <coughs> Excuse me. Coming by way of Preston's thoughts with 365 subscribers calling out some Android manufacturers for being hypocrites. Uh, specifically, a company that I feel we can all bandwagon on, Samsung. When Samsung makes very mean-spirited ads mocking Apple, Apple employees, and Apple customers, and then turns around to do the exact same thing that they just made fun of Apple for doing. I feel hypocrite. That's probably an appropriate term. In the three spot, a hearing health video from some doofus in a with a punchable face and a and a dorky cap, uh, looking at how you can turn your smartphone into some kind of hearable or hearing aid. Number four spot, Rolando gathered a group of YouTube creators to chat out our favorite tech of 2020. We got Andrew Wallace, we've got Sam from Across the Podcast, we got TK, we've got Josh Vergara, we've got Issa Does Tech. It's a good roundup, so thank you, Rolando, for having me on. We've got a Poco M3 gaming test. We've got a Pixel 4a long-term review. We got Snubs. We got Shannon looking at her year in review. Uh, we've got Tech Odyssey, uh, my BlackBerry pal, looking at the Key 2 from 20, uh, for 2021. Uh, it's the uh, the best keyboard-enabled phone on the market still, and I completely agree with that assessment, but hopefully we see something fun in 2021 that can maybe give it a run for its money. We've got spectacular gadgets looking at the LG Wing. We got the Mag Easy Pataka Wallet from TK Bay. Um, and this one was a fun video. I'm really glad this made it onto the list of uh, the popular videos from last week. I replaced my desktop PC with a $250 phone from Travis MCP. And Travis gave me a little shout out in that video. So whenever someone says something nice about me, I have to uh, likewise <laughs> share that video and try and make it more popular. Saying nice things about me, flattery will get you everywhere. Near and dear to my heart. Dude took an LG G8 that he got for 250 bucks, plugged it into a monitor, used a keyboard and mouse, got uh, external storage, hooked it all up, used LG's, I mean, admittedly not as good as Dex, but used LG's desktop mode, and went, got his work done. If we're still pretending that phones aren't pocket computers with a significant amount of processing power that goes untapped, then you're bad at tech. You're really not good at this stuff. So, I mean, Travis, you know, I, I could have sworn I was following him on Twitter. I don't know if I got unsubbed or unfollowed or what. But anyway, really respect the effort that he put to putting a video like that together. 250 bucks, And for a lot of your general computing needs, you could probably replace a desktop. It's really not as as difficult a lifestyle transition as as tech enthusiasts want to make it sound like. So I'm going to reach out to him. Um, he he was, you know, he seemed to have a lot of fun putting this challenge together. I kind of need to see if there's a way I can get a next doc in his hands. Um, as someone who, again, I, I am a very big fan of this idea of this mission. And uh, I'm also going to reach out to Josh Quinones, um, who I, I believe still doesn't really use a computer for anything. Like he does all of his work off of, I think, a phone and a tablet. So uh, I think that could be kind of a nice, like, fun cross-channel sort of communication. 
um, spreading the good word. There is so much more use you could get out of your phone. And, uh, you know, I, I don't feel techies are really getting the message across that there's a reason, there are reasons why you might want to spend more on a phone and uh, why a more powerful chipset is better for laptop replacement use as opposed to acting like it matters if your Snapchat opens a fraction of a millisecond faster. So um, I made it top three. So I, I beat Sam and Matt. So if Matt's talking trash about me on my own subreddit, um, I beat him bad. I think we can all we can all agree on that. Um, but yeah, uh, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. We can always use more sharing. We can always use more support. Don't be stingy with the upvotes. As you start building a little more momentum, little more momentum on something like Reddit, it's more likely that your content will get shared, will get uh, eyeballs. Maybe it gets passed over to, you know, like a larger subreddit, like a technology or a smartphone or an Android subreddit. This stuff really matters, and especially like the top two positions, both were channels that had one channel had a thousand subscribers and one channel had three hundred and sixty. So I feel like this is a bit more democratic than the YouTube algorithm telling you what's popular. Here you're seeing a broader collection of, of tech commentators and that they're getting upvoted by people as, you know, who are legitimately a part of this community. I mean, this is super grassroots. Um, I think we just broke, let me check my stats here. No, we didn't just break. We are at 1,440 uh, members on Glowing Rectangles. So 1,400 people here. And it's growing week by week. It's, it's a labor of love. But the community here is becoming my favorite to follow just for new videos and f to find new creators that I want to subscribe to. Um, from Scrappy Coco, Travis's video was really cool. The way he proved you can use a phone years old as a personal computer was awesome. Um, I mean, I'm saying like he got the idea from me because I'm I'm really good at all this, but I'm glad I'm glad he I'm glad he said something about it too. <laughs> uh, Kyoto, thank you. I'm gonna take another sip actually here. And across the podcast, I need to give this Huawei desktop mode a working through. You really do. I still think Huawei is my favorite. I kind of like the Huawei desktop layout better than Dex. Dex is just more accessible because, like I said, I haven't played with a Huawei since the P20. Um, let's see. Simon says, Hypno, I definitely want a Next Dock Touch. So I like the Next Dock Touch. As I've been playing back and forth, the second generation Next Dock, I kind of like the metal casing better. But the Next Dock Touch is really handy for, especially when you're sort of. Uh, you know, kind of going in that mixed tablet kind of use. So you can go from the keyboard to touch something on the screen because so many Android apps are very touch uh, focused. You know, they're assuming you're going to use it on, on a touch screen, on a tablet or on a smartphone. I'll be curious to see the, the next dock touch has already been discontinued and next is, is uh, replacing it with a swivel keyboard. So it's a full 360 degree hinge. So you could plug it in and use it as a slate, as just a tablet, or you can open up the keyboard, prop it up in a tent mode, put it up in like a kiosk mode. It could be, it could be good. So yeah, I'm, I might need to add to my collection of next docs and get another one. Um, but just just adding a keyboard and a trackpad to average Android apps is kind of huge. I mean, it makes me feel so much more productive just having a decent keyboard under my fingers. I'm, I'm very positive on the next dock. <laughs> From Kyoto Rasanti. Phone, a computer? Um, Matt Tyler, phones and desktop modes are the future. <laughs> Nikki85 was was bringing up how the next dock touch is no longer in production, but I at least helped him out by explaining the next dock 360. Is the next dock 360? I think that's what it's called. I was like, oh, you saved me a lot of typing there. So who wants to talk about some new phones? Um, Xiaomi had a phone come out or at least announced. I don't know if it's shipping yet. I've seen some benchmarks start creeping up for it, but uh, uh, the Xiaomi Mi 11. Let's get this up here. 
First Snapdragon 888 phone packs a sub $650 price tag. Hmm. Hmm. So I am really curious about what Xiaomi's lineup is going to be. Uh, they are so early. I mean, first of all, just think about how crazy it is that, like, wh when did this when did this story break? Do they even have it here? They don't. They don't have their date in the description here on Android Authority. I'm gonna have to write Android Authority. What's up with that? I want to know when you publish your articles. This is this is crazy craziness. January first phone out of the gate, Xiaomi Mi 11 with uh, Qualcomm's new chipset. It's not a it's not an, uh, a Samsung announcement. It's Xiaomi. <clears throat> so uh, we've got a pretty decent collection of specs on tap here. Um, 1440p resolution with a 120 hertz refresh rate. Um, let's see. It's going to be brighter. 1500 nits peak brightness with Gorilla Glass Victus. So a much more durable Gorilla Glass up front. I'm really excited to see that. Uh, 4,600 milliamp hour battery, 55 watt charging, a 108 megapixel main camera with a 13 megapixel ultra wide. The five megapixel is being called a telephoto macro. So I'm gonna be curious to see how that works. But I think this is actually gonna be a trend that we see more of. Instead of using the ultra wide as the macro shooter, you might get, you might need more distance. Like you won't be able to hold the phone right up on top of the subject, but using a telephoto could be really interesting for macro photography. Like um, for example, on the V60, there is no autofocus on the ultra wide and there is no additional telephoto or macro sensor. So when I wanna take a macro shot on the V60, I actually do a two time zoom. So it's just kind of a pre-crop but then the phone kind of manages a resolution bump, even though it's technically having the number of pixels and it works pretty well. I mean, you get a, a, a stunningly soft, uh, shallow depth of field when you use that, that kind of combo. So if you were to use a proper telephoto sensor, that could be a good macro shooter. But again, I'll just be uh, interested to see because this 108 megapixel camera, this hardware is so good. Um, I got to play with it on the Note 20 Ultra, and the sensor is incredible. I mean, when we talk about real dynamic range, not fake software HDR dynamic range, what you can do on that larger um, 108 sensor is pretty incredible, especially when you're talking about putting out 12 megapixel stills. Um, when you pixel bin that all down for a nine to one subpixel crop, it's I mean, subpixel bin. Um, it's pretty incredible. So I just want to see if Xiaomi software can make better use of that hardware than what Samsung could do, because I did not like Samsung's HDR processing. So uh, other noteworthy features seen on the new flagship include Harman Kardon tuned stereo speakers, heart rate, heart rate detection via the Goodix in-display fingerprint sensor, um, NFC and IR blaster, um, extended support for Wi-Fi 6. You've got Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2, and the ability to connect two Bluetooth headsets to the same device. And all of this starting at, I mean, when we you know, account for the exchange rates for around $612. So importing one is going to be a little bit trickier, a little bit pricier, but I'm seriously considering trying to spend some time with one of the... Uh, when, when, when these start hitting more of like the international releases, um, I'm, I'm very interested in maybe giving one of these a, a, a spin. I don't know, folks out there, like uh, I, I know, especially folks in my comments have, are actually better versed with Xiaomi than, um, than I am often, just because I don't get to play with them as often as I'd like to. Um, but yeah, DTNL, 650 and it has Victus. So yeah, I think the first phone that had it out was the Note 20. And like, even just for the material science and the costs for building a phone, like that's a pretty incredible pairing. So there have been some early benchmarks that have come out with the Mi 11 and some people have complained like, oh, well, I mean, the Snapdragon 888 isn't showing that it's much better than the 865. I'm not thinking a $600 Xiaomi is going to be 
the threshold by which we judge the new Snapdragon. I could be wrong. Xiaomi might have optimized the crap out of this chipset, but at $600, I don't think they did. <laughs> I feel like a few more manufacturers who are really good at extracting horsepower and then also including better thermal management hardware like vapor chambers or heat pipes or whatever you need on the inside of the phone, I think we'll see the true test of the 888 on a more expensive device. But it's very encouraging to see the first phone of the of this new generation come out at iPhone 12 prices like that we're hitting that segment so hard Th think about the radio management improvements by moving the modem back onto the SOC and then comparing that against an iPhone 12 like that's good competition especially now that we'll be A14 to Snapdragon 888 that's very good competition <laughs> Simon says Hypno says the Mi Note 10 was good not the best UI but camera and battery life were stellar again I I, I don't think I've spent much time with the Xiaomi since the Mi 9 I, I mean again like Huawei it's a brand that has very little interest in a United States reviewer of my size and it's something I really want to correct for is getting just a little bit more international flair on my YouTube channel <laughs> from ER1980 here in the UK I can see Mi 11 Pro OnePlus 9 Pro and most likely Find X3 Pro trading blows this year like Oppo and BBK they're gonna have a real strong year I think in the UK because again those phones that you're talking about there are gonna fill all of the gaps from the companies that are struggling to put phones out in the EU and the UK like LG right we're going to talk about LG rumors here in just a bit, but if you're in the UK and you can't get your hands on a V70, you know, the replacement for the V60, a Find X3 looks like the right fit to soothe that, that um, you know, that, that omission from your region. Aditya Anil, but the A14 Bionic is faster. <laughs> I, I again, I I, uh, I took a beating on an Apple. I, was it our Apple or our, our iPhone? I can't remember. But you know they were they were doing another thing like showing benchmarks. Uh, based on this one Geekbench score, the Qualcomm 888 is a total failure and can't even catch up to the A14. And like immediately, all the comments were like, "Yeah, because Apple says they're the fastest, and it's been it's a known fact that Apple is like two generations ahead of any Android." So I put in a comment, I couldn't help but wade in and just say like, yeah, but we're all real focused on machine learning. And when it comes to neural core processing, you know, the A14 only catches up to the 865 and the real chipset that the A14 is gonna compete against is the 888, which is gonna have a generation significantly better radio management hardware which has always been a struggle for apple use 5g on an iphone and it's gonna it's gonna hit that tiny battery a lot harder and of course it's like oh all i see is a bunch of justifying and you're like yeah because you won one cpu score and apple won't even let you use the full horsepower of that cpu anyway so okay go feel good about your a14 bionics and listen to your apple marketing but Generation to generation, the differences here are so much finer than that one unlabeled bar graph that Apple put up during their keynote. Oh, and from Dave Bow9, once you get into 5G compatibility, a Xiaomi or a Huawei will be a tough sell in the United States. You know, that's what I've been kind of curious about is like, I don't think a Xiaomi would. I mean, for the United States, we got all persnickety about ZTE because they sell network equipment. And we got real persnickety about Huawei because they sell, um, you know, carrier and uh, ISP equipment. But we didn't get real pissy about BBK. You know, OnePlus made it onto carriers. So it's not just like, it's not just, it's a Chinese brand. It's do they compete with our telecommunications infrastructure? And that's when we seem to get real concerned. 
So I think if Xiaomi were to come here, like, because they already sell a bunch of stuff here. You can buy their cameras. They sold their laptop for a while. Uh, Newegg, we used to sell the, the crap out of their scooters. Of all the weird things that you would think of for Xiaomi, like, their lifestyle stuff sold like crazy um, on Newegg in the United States. I don't think their phones would be scrutinized like a Huawei or a ZTE were. <clears throat> mm. Nick Val, I totally feel you here. I wish there was a way to dual boot Windows on ARM off of my phone. That's the desktop mode I want. And, and I don't know if Dave Burns is still in here, but it would be nice if we could have some kind of direct Linux kernel. Like if I could just fire up Linux and use that as my desktop mode, I would be all about that. The only thing I think like what desktop modes try to accomplish is two computers at the same time. So your phone still works as your phone and it's driving a desktop style experience. And that seems to be the challenge. Like doing that well takes a lot more software polish than just I'm going to turn off my phone and turn it into a desktop. And then when I unplug it, it's going to deactivate the desktop mode and go back to being my phone. Um, and that's one of the things that like I loved about Huawei and I, I like about Dex. It is so seamless that you can use both at the same time. Um, that's that's really exciting. Um, from ER1980, the machine learning progress in the new ISP in the A88 is what will be interesting to see as the year goes on. Like, I'm not concerned. I would actually like the A88 to keep the same performance as the 865 and then just give me better battery life. I'd be good with that. There is so little that taxes my 865. Rendering 4K video 60 frames per second at a YouTube high quality bit rate, I'm doing fine. I'm doing better than fine. I'm doing really well. It takes it takes at least $1,600 worth of laptop to properly outpace my V60 in rendering high quality 4K video. No one, who is doing that? Who, who, who needs on a phone, right? So we're good. So if you were to give me the exact same tier of performance, but then give me like a 20% improvement in battery life, milliamp hour to milliamp hour, I'd be, I'd be stoked. I'm all for it. And then all of the other coprocessors, the, the machine learning, the neural processing, the signal ISP, the, the camera ISP, all of that's just gravy. Making all that better. Awesome. It's beautiful. Just do it. I'm good. <sighs> <laughs> um simon says hypno the sony's are available in the uk that's actually a good point too um uh, sony had a really strong year i'm very anxious about the the xperia one mark three again uh, hold on do i have my xperia one hold on it's over here on the table because i was on the tk with tk and we were both um manically and frustratedly trying to see if we ever got the Android 11 update, because I believe the United States Xperia 1s are the only Xperia 1s that have not gotten Android 11 yet. And we still don't have it. I'm gonna swipe. There is an update. Give it to me. I want it. Gerg. All right. Um... Let's see. Um, from Tobiznawajagu. Have you heard about the LG Rainbow? Yeah, the uh, the Rainbow is looking really interesting. We're going to talk about the V70 here next. Um, uh, from Aditya, wasn't there an article that Hibiki shared on the Discord with numbers showing 888 battery use on the Xiaomi? Um I can't remember. I think that was the sort of the early testing that I was sort of alluding to where I don't believe that Xiaomi will, again, just having the bestest chipset. And it's one of the things that I think like Pocos are, 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 are fascinating options. They're, they're solid recommendations. They are nerd core phones. But I don't feel that just because you bought the cheapest possible version of a phone with the most powerful processor, that you're really getting the full benefit of that processor. 
you know, when we look at rightfully why a Samsung costs more, I point to advertising first, but there is a fair amount of additional code and optimization that takes place on top of that. And it's also why when you pick up a Pixel, an underpowered Pixel can feel so so much snappier than you think it might. That hardware software, software optimization matters. So from a hardware component standpoint where I doubt Xiaomi will be putting as much money into the thermals of managing the performance and managing the heat extraction and making sure everything's running consistently there. And on top of the software strategy, I feel like, yeah, you're going to make some compromises on a $600 phone that has all of the other fun, nice lifestyle features. Not everything can be polished to the same degree when you're charging $400 less than a competitor with similar specs. So um, I, I can't remember if Hibiki shared it. I'm pretty sure that's that's what, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's kind of what's rattling around in my brain when um, I was uh, kind of referencing that. From Nick Fell, if Windows on ARM is done properly, it could do phone things with a texting app and a dialer, and I don't think it'd need much more, and those could be built as pre-installed apps. I feel building a new desktop mode is the ass backwards way of doing this. And I'm going to say potato, potato, man. Um, I don't know of a way that you can do dual boot that consumers will want to use it. I, I know dual boot would, would be preferred for people that are trying to extract every ounce of horsepower and potential use out of a phone. But there is something so critically accessible about desktop mode on LG, Huawei, and Samsung, where I pop in a USB cable and I open the clamshell on my next dock and there's a computer. And then when I need to look at my phone, there's a phone. If any of that operation were interrupted to boot another operating system, I feel most consumers would look at that as a bridge too far. That's just me. Plenty of people will disagree with me. But the reason why desktop mode utilizing the exact same apps and services, I feel, has a strong argument to be made for its existence is that very visibly accessible ease of use. It immediately tells you what's going on and you're never left without the familiarity of the device that lives in your pocket. Simon says, Hypno, does the Android 11 update, update for the Sony One Mark II allow lowering of resolution to increase frame rate? I have no idea. I don't have it. I actually haven't been reading up on other regions that have gotten the update because I want to just tackle it fresh. Like, no spoilers. I want to I want to see what's in my Xperia. <laughs> ah. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is starting to flake here. So we've got two more things to talk about and then we're gonna start wrapping this up. Um, who wants to talk about a V70? Because I don't think it's gonna be called the V70. Um, this is a forum.vn, cellphones.com.vn slash S forum. Uh, this is not in a native language that I can speak. So I'm just gonna pull up the screen. Uh, this is... Um, this is gonna be interesting. Uh, the folks on the V60 subreddit weren't really feeling this. I'm, I'm mostly positive on it with one spec that I wish were a bit beefier. Um, but this is the, the proposed leaked design. This is the rumored design for the V70. And uh, it's not a V series, is it? So this is looking like a velvet. It's looking a lot like a velvet, right? You know, the camera water drop arrangement, smaller lenses descending on the side of the frame, curved glass, curved edges. Um, there's like a little hole punch instead of the widow's peak notch. Um, yeah, th if if you liked, where is my V60? It's way over there. It's I, I won't need to pick it up. If you liked the V60 for being that flat front face kind of chunk of a tank, that's not here. And uh, it would seem to me that in LG's efforts to try and minimize the number of phones that they make that don't get sold, that their strategy for evolving out of the G and V series will be to combine the V series and the Velvet. And this is actually something that I've been kind of advocating for since, 
I don't know, like the G7. When the G7 came out and it was basically just a baby V series, and I felt like why why pretend that we have these different variations? Like make them the same line of phones. Just combine all of the things that kind of make them. And if you want, do like a little version and a big version. Now I'm even more inclined to say just just make one one phone because we're going to have like uh, we were talking about earlier in the chat we're going to have the explorer program for scrolling screens hopefully we get a wing follow up i'd love to see a wing too like i think that would be really cool and then the bread and butter is on the stylo and the k series like lg makes most of their money on those lower cost offerings so let's just whittle this down let's Combine the prettier aspects of the velvet, even though that's going to annoy me having curved edges on that screen. I'd prefer a flat front face. But we also know in terms of sales, I bet you the velvet did did better in a lot of regions because it was a little bit cheaper, MSRP, and it was prettier. You put the velvet and the V60 side by side, I think a lot of consumers are going to go, oh, but that phone, that phone's prettier. So... If you look at the V70 or whatever this phone's going to be called as a V60 replacement, you're probably going to be a little annoyed that it's going to have a smaller battery. It's going to have, according to this rumor, according to this leak, I'm going to say this is more a rumor than a leak. Um, it's going to have the same size battery capacity as the Velvet. Okay. I'm a little concerned about that because the V60 is a battery marathon champ. <clears throat> So I'll, I'll be a little more disappointed there. Curved screen and a smaller battery, ugh. But then when I compare that against my Velvet, all of this is an upgrade. So going back into the specs here, some of these are pretty crazy. They're saying that this is gonna be a 6.5 inch display with a true UHD crop that vertically it's gonna be 3840 by a width of 1640 at 120 Hertz. So that's where I'm, I'm a little, maybe not, that this, this rumor might be reaching a bit far, but this would be like having the display on an Xperia 1 Mark II running at 120 Hertz. So a UHD video, a UHD resolution display and high refresh rate would be a pretty big leap from where we were with LG over a year of 60 Hertz, 1080p displays. That one would be kind of a big deal. Then uh, Snapdragon 888, uh, 12 and 16 gig RAM options, uh, 256 and 512 uh, storage options with UFS 3.1. Um, there they're saying the 4300 milliamp hour battery with 45 watt charging 25 watt wireless charging and 5 watt reverse charging um and then we get into the camera sensors and uh hold on i've got to just kind of i don't think i can keep the phone right there can i still see yeah okay so a main shooter at 50 megapixels a 12 megapixel two times um, focal length at 52 millimeters, and then a 64 megapixel sensor at 130 millimeters. So I'm curious to, I'll be curious to see if this is a zoom, a, a periscoping zoom sensor with Samyang glass, which is also kind of interesting if they do have a partnership with a lens manufacturer like Samyang. Um, I'll be curious to see, is this going to be like the note where the periscoping camera action was on a, a a more traditional camera sensor, but then it's also backed up by a super megapixel dense sensor for certain types of zoom or for. I, I, I'm 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 curious to see this. This is another one of those areas where this rumor, I'm not sure this is going to be the stack of cameras we get. But the one I really want is when they say that this is going to have a 48 megapixel, 13 millimeter wide angle. That would be really nice. How many people talked about how amazing the Galaxy S20, the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra, having that great zoom. Oh, it's got this great telephoto zoom. But Samsung's ultra wides were just kind of eh, like they were good. They were just sort of average. 
If you wanted the best wide angle photography and video in 2020, it was the OnePlus 8 Pro. The OnePlus 8 Pro is using the half inch 48 megapixel sensor that used to be the main premium sensor on 2019 phones. That's the sensor that's on the OnePlus 8 Pro and it's still, someone please correct me if I'm wrong here. I, I, it might be, and oh, and I, honestly, I don't know if the iPhone 12 can do this. I haven't seen anyone try. Shoot 4K 60 frame per second video from the main sensor and without stopping the recording, switch to the ultra wide. And no other phones that I know of from 2020 can pull off that trick. It's the OnePlus 8 Pro. And it's because that 48 megapixel ultra wide is a beast of a sensor. And it's the best sensor you can use so far for an ultra wide. So if LG does that too, I'm going to be very excited about the V70 as a photo and video solution. I mean, even on my... um. Like through my V50, I would often shoot from the ultra wide uh, because, you know, like I would have to hold it a little further out because the, the, the focusing, you know, because it's a fixed focus lens. Like if you get too close, you're out of focus. It's really handy to line up a shot and do a walk and talk from an ultra wide. If I had that at 60 frames per second again, but from a much nicer sensor, V70 immediately becomes a primary vlogging mobile production solution. I use telephoto way less than I use ultra wide and having a nicer sensor on that ultra wide would make me very happy. So we'll have to see. Uh, there's no report on this rumors to whether or not there's gonna be a uh, quad DAC. Um, I don't know if we're gonna properly say goodbye to the headphone jack on LG devices. If they do, like they did on the wing, we need a better solution for audio input. Like I need a USB audio input in the LG camera app if they get rid of that headphone jack. Uh, and that's another thing we don't know. Simon says Hypno is asking if, uh, are they gonna go with dual screen again? And I hope they don't give up on dual screen. I, I love dual screen. It's one of the main reasons why the V60 kept my SIM card as long as it did. I've just I've gotten into so many bad habits of like multitasking on steroids. <laughs> uh, from Gorin, Samsung definitely and LG possibly will offer the worst regular flagships this year. Their focus goes more to foldable. There's where the improvements will be. S21s are more FE than real galaxies. Ultra is S21 with abnormal price. I mean, but we'll have to see. Um, again, LG has kind of surprised in the past. So let's say this V70 player comes out at like 999. This would be a, a, a monster competitive handset at 999 to compete against an S21 Plus or whatever other premium phone is coming out. Um, I, I think from LG's perspective, they're, they're probably mitigating the balance of other upper mid-ranger products and then just kind of acknowledging like, man, people buy the K-series. You know, that's that's where our, we really make our money here. <laughs> from Vazicos 8, Huawei has the biggest ultra-wide sensors. Someone tell me what the sensor size is on a current Huawei for the ultra-wide, because I'm kind of curious. I didn't know of anyone else that was doing um, half inch or bigger. If there's an ultra wide out there that's using something better than that half inch sensor, I want to know about it. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno says the 888 does allow for camera switching during filming. That's cool. But again, I, I haven't seen of any others with an 865 that can do that. Um, LG can't. Samsung couldn't. Um, I'm trying to think. Sony can't. Even when um, you're you're sort of doing uh, in the Cinema Pro, you're you're mostly just uh, zooming in on that sensor. So let's say you start shooting from the telephoto, and then you you, you want to like slide to a wider shot. It it doesn't 
it doesn't switch sensors. You have to stop recording and, and switch to another sensor. Um, yeah, I can't think of anyone else. Apple couldn't on the iPhone 11. So the A13 was not powerful enough to handle multiple camera sensors moving back and forth while recording one clip. I think it might be OnePlus. Um, or, or someone with, um, with an A14. We have some iPhone users. Try it right now. Set your camera to 4K, 60 frames per second. Shoot video from the main sensor and then try and switch to the ultra wide. And let me know if it works. That would be great. Um, let's see. Goran Petrovic is saying F1.8 aperture and 18 millimeter equivalent field of view. But that's not the sensor size. Um, Huawei P40 Pro, 40 megapixels, F1.8, 18 millimeters, and it's a 1 over 1.54? That I want to check out. Okay. So now that's a good fight. You know, from the half-inch sensor on this OnePlus 8, I would... I'd be curious. Oh, and Tomic 102, the iPhone 12 won't switch. Well, thank you very much for putting that in. I'm not going to slather you in the snarky comments that I would reserve for Apple. Anything that I would say is sort of a, um, a, a snarky comment about the iPhone's inability to do that is not leveraged at you. You did not make the phone, but thank you for testing that. I really appreciate it. All right. Um, lastly, I just kind of wanted to touch on this because uh, I thought it was an interesting look at the at the future of Samsung. We were just talking about Goran Petrovic was saying, you know, like, here's what's going on with, you know, Samsung's are going to be too expensive and stuff. This to me makes me feel like maybe we will see Samsung kill off the Note line in 2021. There have been conflicting rumors like the Note's going to go away, the Note's going to stay, only the the Z Fold 3 is going to have a built-in uh, stylus silo, but we're seeing some some evidence of the next S21 Ultra having stylus support, but obviously they're not going to put the stylus silo in the phone, so you've got to carry the stylus some other way. So this is Samsung's solution. This article is coming by way of Peter, at GSM Arena, new leak shows Galaxy S21 Ultra case designed specifically for the S Pen. Uh, let's get into some close-ups here. Um, can I shrink this? I want more of it on screen. There we go. So it's got this like fold-over, like always-on display ticker case. You know, it's like the front screen on the dual display case for LG phones where you can kind of just see the time and some of your notifications. And then it's got a sort of the same sized hinge assembly as what's on an LG, but it's just a big old hole so that you can keep a stylus with your phone. So I think that's kind of an acceptable solution. Um, you know, it, like if I if I hold up my, my V60 here, you know, all, all of this mechanism on the hinge you have to have all of that space on the S21 Ultra so that you can slide in a pen. So I guess that works. I don't know, any any Note users in here? Is this a solution that's gonna work for you? I, so many people love to come to my channel when I talk about stylus support on LG and say, well, it's practically useless to me because I need the stylus with me all the time. And like, okay, I get that. You know, the immediacy of like, I pop the stylus out of the phone and I'm willing to compromise and have less battery for those times that I use the stylus. That makes sense. So if this is the solution, is that something that's going to help you move from a Note to an S21? Uh, you, it's a case that you can put the pen in. Is that, is that the solution? Because one of the things I've kind of also gotten used to, though, I don't, I don't have a problem keeping the pen in my pocket because I already have a chunk of a phone in there. I like having a thicker pen. Even against the flat stylus for my Surface, I kind of wish I had gotten one of the full-sized Surface pens because I, I like having a more, you know, like almost crayon fat um, pen implement. 
And I really don't like the ultra super skinny, teeny tiny styluses like on the notes. I don't like those as much now that I've been using the bigger, fatter pens. So so anyway, sorry. Um, do, do we have anyone in here? Is, is this the solution that you want to see? Is that is that going to help solve this issue? If you couldn't buy a note, would this be the case you would put your S21 in so that you could carry a stick with your phone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? And, and especially like on a wallet case. So you get a little ticker display so that you can kind of see the time. And then you're using as much, almost as much space on a wallet case for an S20 as you would a dual display case on a V60. Because you need the extra plastic on the side here that's going to act, that, that's going to take up almost as much space as the hinge on the V60. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some of these comments. <laughs> Dave Burns, why not just do dual display? <clears throat> and Tomic is saying, wait, the silo is in the left? Um, let's see. From Marilink is saying the 12 Pro Max does seem to change from the ultra wide and the telephoto while shooting video. That's good to know. Um, Dave Burns, I love my Note 8 stylus and its convenience and the battery life wasn't a huge issue for me. I don't know why people complained so much. I did replace my battery in the phone twice because the screen broke twice. Okay. Uh, Marilink is saying, nope, I don't want the separate pen. Uh, Nick Fell is saying, I feel like the case should have more functionality. Well, I mean, but, you know, you got to hold a pen. That's that's functional. <laughs> From McCorkerin, the only reason I discovered LG phones and by extension some gadget guy was because how pumped up I was about the dual display. Mm -hmm. I'm from McCorkerin. If I had a phone like that, I would probably buy a case like that, but I might not use it all the time. Um, Simon says, if no, I've seen worse implementations. <laughs> <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And then Dave Burns, the S Pen they showed off looks bigger than the old S Pens. So looking at how much space that they're allowing for this, I think it's going to be flat. I think they're going to go with something that's a little bit more like my Surface Pen. So when we when I go back into screen share here, it's going to be a little thicker because like this is sort of a traditional S Pen and they don't have anything side by side to compare it. So this, I think, is going to be, and actually in this render, it looks like the whole pen is, is sort of flatter on the top and bottom with the button and kind of rounded on the sides so that it'll go in sideways against the full depth of the phone in that kind of case cradle. So yeah, it will be a little thicker, but I don't think this, I mean, this looks like it's going to end up being slimmer and thinner than my Surface Pen because I have the flat portable Surface Pen and it's definitely not going to be as 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 chunky and grippable as like a good Wacom pen. Um, it's going to be skinnier than that. I mean, I think that's going to be an improvement. I will like that better than uh, the super skinny S Pens. <laughs> Uh, from McCorkerin 3, I'm sure Samsung is doing whatever makes them the most money, but it looks really bizarre from here sometimes. Um, yeah. No, I mean, because think about it. If you want to know, now you need to buy an S21 Ultra. So you're, what, around a $1,300, $1,400 phone? And then you just buy the separate stylus. And then if you want to keep the stylus handy so that you, you've got a place to dock it, you just buy a really expensive Samsung case. So your Galaxy Note will be a $1,600 purchase. It's easy. I mean, if that's what you, if that's what you need, then you have an upgrade path. You're going to be fine. <laughs> um, from Dave Burns, have you seen or used the S Pens from the Tab series? I feel like that would be neat to use on the Ultra. I think TK played with that a bit more. We were doing a live stream where we were trying to get an S Pen from one of the Tabs to work and it didn't, and it was because we didn't know where the setting was on the Note. I think he got it working though. I think that would be better. Again, I, I, th there, there are so many pros and cons. I want 
the more battery and I want the fatter pen. So I'm kind of fine not having a silo anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of good. <laughs> um, from McCorkerin3, what's the entry level price point to get a phone with S Pen functionality in the new line? If they discontinue the Note, it's going to be whatever the S21 Ultra goes for. And I'm assuming that this is going to be around a $1,400 phone. So that, that's where you start. And then the rumor is that the Z Fold 3 will have a silo built in for the stylus. So you're going to go from $1,400 to $2,000. And that's the range of what Samsung is going to charge for a stylus-enabled device. So you got to look at having the pen on your phone in that case being worth twice as much as having a separate stylus pen. And I, I, I can't say that that's worth it for me. So I, I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, we should probably go ahead and wrap this up because I also really have to go to the bathroom. I'm starting to do like little wiggles in my chair here. Um, yeah, before my voice completely fails, um, happy new year. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious and excited about a new year of tech, about some fun topics to cover, some new gadgets to take a look at and where we can go with the future of our consumer electronics conversations. I'm talking to a couple outlets, maybe also doing some guest posting and some guest hosting on some other sites just to kind of spread it around and see who we can collaborate with more. Uh, be on the lookout. I'm going to be doing some more live streaming with TK. Um, TK and I, just some good, friendly, bantery kinds of conversations that I think will be a lot of fun to follow too. And then obviously keeping up the conversations on this channel for a little bit more uh, focus on tech, uh, tech and politics and uh, how we can be sort of better tech neighbors and tech citizens, which especially with the audience, with the, the, the crew of people that I see here in, in the live chat, I'm always eternally grateful to be able to start my week off with these conversations. So even better this time, not just starting my week off, but starting my year off on some great chats. And then if you're on the Patreon, keep a, keep a lookout. Hopefully this afternoon or this evening, we can start talking about some fun games to play. My vote is gonna be heavy for Among Us to do a Patreon game night, and we're gonna take it from there. So folks, um, happy new year. Happy The happiest of new years, especially as we say goodbye to 2020 and what an, an interesting year it was uh, for all of us. I'm sure a challenging year it was for all of us. Um, as I started this podcast, I'll finish. I hope you and your family are well. I hope you had some time off. I hope you had some celebratory events that were safe um, and that everyone is happy and healthy as we kick off a new year. And uh, as we do for the year, I also hope you do for your week. I hope you have an amazing week with your gadgets. I hope you have an incredible week I hope you do awesome. Um, I, I, I hope you uh, I hope you be awesome. And I'll catch you back here next week for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SDGQA podcast channel. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I really appreciate it. And it, it is very refreshing getting back into the flow and getting to have these kinds of conversations. So be safe, be happy, be well. And I'll catch you back here next week. Take care. I love y'all.